Wade Phillips was born on January 19, 1883 on an 80-acre farm in Conway, Iowa, in the southwest corner of the state. Waite was the seventh of ten children, and one of those children was his identical twin, Wyatt. Wyatt and Waite were best friends, virtually joined at the hip. They spent almost all of their time together, and whenever they were apart, they prided themselves in always knowing where the other one was and what they were doing. They were so similar that no one could tell them apart, not even their parents, really. So whenever one of them got into trouble, both were punished. They didn't take offense, though, since they were so like-minded that they figured if their twin misbehaved, they probably would have done the same thing anyways. When Waite and Wyatt were still young, their oldest brothers, Frank and Ellie, were exploring the Wild West as traveling barbers, salesmen, and railroaders. They would send letters home and tell their tales of, that sparked a sense of adventure and wanderlust in the twins that would define the rest of their lives. At the ripe old age of 16, they set out on their own westward journey. Packing light, they took a train down to St. Joseph, Missouri. They found jobs working as farmhands, but they were determined to see the West, and the quickest way there was to take jobs with the Union Pacific Railroad. The company paid their way to Wyoming to work on the railroad. As soon as they got to Wyoming, they realized the West was everything they had imagined and more, and they had resolved to see it all. After saving enough money to move on, they set out to Salt Lake City and they found new jobs. They continued this cycle for the next three years. They would move from new area to new area and take any job they could find, saving money until they could move on. Over the years, they worked about every job you could imagine for a young man out west at that time. They were miners, smelters, factory workers, loggers, millers, construction workers, waiters, hotel attendants, fishermen, river boatmen. They even spent a winter fur trapping in the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana. Their journey came to a very sudden end, though, when on July 16, 1902, Wyatt contracted appendicitis and died. Waite was devastated. He didn't know what to do, so he did the only thing he could think of, go back home to Iowa to bury his brother. Now back home, Waite fell into a very deep depression, and his brothers Frank and Ellie realized that he needed to do something to keep his mind off of Wyatt. So they secretly paid a grocer to hire him as a clerk. While he was working there, they realized he had a talent for business, and they wanted to invest in that, so they paid his way to go through college, where after only six months, he graduated with a degree in accounting and immediately got a job as a bookkeeper. It was then that he met the love of his life, the lovely and intelligent Genevieve Elliott, whom he would eventually marry. Genevieve was the local banker's daughter. She received the best education available, and from her father's mentorship, she was very financially astute. In fact, throughout his entire business career, Waite didn't make any financial decisions without first consulting Genevieve. Waite's wanderlust never really left him. He still needed a sense of adventure in his life. So he set off again, except this time, instead of trying to see the West as quickly as possible, he would take short stints of work in a new place whenever he felt restless. Eventually, in 1906, Frank and Ellie decided to recoup on their investment, and they invited Waite to come down to Oklahoma to work one of their oil companies in banking. However, in doing so, they didn't give him any special treatment. He was brought in as an entry-level position, just like anyone else, and he had to prove himself every step of the way. This treatment turned out to be the best thing they could have done for him. It gave him the opportunity to learn the oil business from the bottom to the top and from the inside out. He worked almost every job in the industry, from laborer to foreman, field to superintendent, office manager, and president of one of the companies. In time, no one knew oil quite like Waite Phillips did. After eight years in business with his brothers, Waite realized he wanted something more. He wanted to expand operations as a wildcatter, making risky oil lease investments, trying to strike it rich. But his brothers wanted to play it safe in banking. So he sold his shares in the company and moved to Arkansas to buy an oil marketing firm. In this way, he learned the only part of the oil business that he hadn't already mastered. After less than a year, Waite felt confident in this business and decided to sell. Between his own savings and the profit from the sale, he was ready to start his master plan, a self-financed, vertically integrated oil empire. With no outside investors, he had complete control of the company, and with his hard-earned knowledge of the trade, he was able to oversee every aspect of its operations. He traded oil leases, drilled for oil, owned pipelines and rail cars that transported crude oil to his refineries, and then distributed and marketed through high-end service stations under the brand name The Waite Phillips Company. From deep in the earth to the consumer's gas tank, Waite owned, managed, and profited every step of the way, and it was incredibly lucrative. 
At its height, Waite was personally earning $40,000 in profit every single day. That's about $1.1 million in today's money. And in 1925, he sold the Waite Phillips Company for $25 million. This was one of the largest oil deals in history at the time, and that money carries the purchasing power of over $400 million today. At this point, Waite knew he had more money than he could reasonably spend in his lifetime. The interesting thing about Waite was that he was never in it for the money. He was in it for the love of the game, the hunt for success, to create a business that added value to the world, both to his customers creating superior products and especially for employees. From the very beginning of the Waite Phillips Company, he had been a profit-sharing operation with his employees, the people that labored to create the profit. But now with this incredible amount of wealth, he wanted to share it with more, the world. That year, Waite and Genevieve decided that for the rest of their lives, they would give at least half of all of their earnings to charitable causes. As Waite said, the only things we keep permanently are those we give away. Now that he was out of the oil game, he wasn't out of a job. He was also heavily invested in land, both for ranching and urban development. In 1922, he began buying up property near Cimarron, New Mexico, and over the next 10 years, he would accumulate over 300,000 acres under one fence. Philmont Ranch was Waite's favorite parcel of land, and where his son Chope grew into a man. Seeing how beneficial these wild lands and ranch work were for his own son, Waite wanted to extend this opportunity to other boys in the nation. So in 1938, Waite donated 36,000 acres to the Boy Scouts of America, as well as $61,000 in cash for developing the land for camping. The very next year, the BSA hosted scouts at Phil Turn Rocky Mountain Scout Camp. Phil for Phillips and Turn for the scout slogan, Do a Good Turn Daily. The Phillips family was still regularly living in the Villa Filmonte, and seeing how well the scouts were using and enjoying the land, he gave another gift in 1941, 91,000 acres. It was his most valuable mountain real estate and it included the Villa Filmonte and ranching headquarters. However, the BSA was a young organization and recognized that running an operation like this could financially ruin the organization. Leaders at the time couldn't see how the BSA could accept and maintain the gift for posterity without eventually selling out and betraying the purpose of the gift. But Wade insisted, and he endowed the BSA with his 23-story Phil Tower building in downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma. The rent from the tower would help finance the operations at Philmont, as it did until 1977 when it was sold. That money was invested and from interest payments continued to help fund Philmont even today. It was a gift that keeps on giving. Altogether, the Phillips family gave the Boy Scouts 127,000 acres, $61,000 in cash, and a beautiful skyscraper in Tulsa. In 1963, a lawyer and businessman from Washington named Norton Clapp bought and donated over 10,000 acres on the east side of Baldy Mountain, raising the pinnacle of scouting to 12,441 feet above sea level. Then in 2015, the BSA used money gained from their endowment to purchase almost 3,000 acres, previously a summer camp for girls known as the Cimarron-Cita Ranch. In total, Philmont consists of 140,000 acres of land, making us the largest private youth camp in the entire world. Since its inception in 1938, Philmont has hosted well over a million scouts and scouters to hike through these mountains.